boy. Another boring, uneventful Hungarian Grand Prix where the team that locks out the front row finishes 1-2. Can we just have anything normal to talk about? Anything of note to talk about in a Formula 1 Grand Prix? Wait. What's that burning smell? Oh. Welcome back to Motorsport 101. I also like Jason's in the chat suggestion. That's one way to finish 2-1. Hey, everybody. Hug up to episode 534 of Motorsport 101. I'm your friendly neighborhood host, Dre Harrison. Glad you could join us as ever. And yeah, on the face of it, that was a really boring Hungarian Grand Prix. Like, it was terrible. We barely got a pass all day. The team that locked out the front row completely dominated, won by 15 seconds, and didn't have any real challenge or competition for the rest of the way. Except this is McLaren, and they can't win a race in a normal fashion. Hashtag no. whatever it takes. If there's no adversity for us to face, we'll make up the adversity ourselves. Hashtag trust the McProcess. <laughs> that, that, that's the show. Um, places you can find us real quick. Yeah, 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 yeah. That really yeah. is it. That really, that really is it. That is most of the show pretty much in a nutshell, because yes, McLaren did win the Hungarian Grand Prix. It's been it's been a while coming to actually have McLaren win one of these damn things after challenging and coming so close so many times. And this one was the opposite. It was a completely straightforward victory in every way, shape. Or, oh, no, it wasn't. Um, the pit wall could not help themselves once again. And See, they, uh, they dominated and got a one two in this event, uh, despite their best efforts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in, in spite of their own incompetence, which we'll get to briefly. But as you can probably guess, uh, the three of you get the three of us back together again. Joining me as ever, first up, Mr. Cam Buckley. Hello, Cam. How's it going? It's going great. It's going fantastic. Now, why is it going so fantastic, Cameron? <laughs> because you, as you always do, have mitched your last bra. <laughs> you had to go there, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, I was we, always there. He <laughs> passed some cars. Pascal Fairline, champion in a series that we're so aggravated with that we basically just stopped covering it on the show entirely. Yeah, we're in that in our last episode. Um, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm RJ O'Connell. I thought Cam was going to leave with the fact that Honda got their one easy layup with nobody oh, yeah. chasing them victory in motorcycle road racing. In the Suzuka eight hours. Yeah. Um, in, in a road racing sense, Honda was working out some problems on everybody over at Suzuka. You know, it's funny because like the first half hour was pretty competitive. There was a Panigale over there for the first time in a while. And then Takumi Takahashi um, dropped the weights. Him, Johan Zarco and young Tepe Nagoi won the Suzuka eight hours together. Takahashi now becomes the first sit-time winner of the Suzuka eight hours, which Incredible. is proof that it may, it may be just because he's cracked at Suzuka and that JSB 1000 is a whole different ballgame for MotoGP, but I've never believed he was as bad as his last outing in MotoGP showed. He was never, he wasn't, I mean, he was put in an impossible situation when the last time we saw him in MotoGP, we all know, anyone who knows their bike racing knows that Takahashi was far, is a far greater talent than what Honda was going to give him in MotoGP on emergency notice. We we all know that. So yeah. um, if you know, you know, and Takahashi becoming a six-time winner of that race is an incredible accomplishment. We, and hey, we Johan Zarco finally gets to smile in the year 2024. I'm so happy for him. The Good first for him. and only time that he will be smiling. <laughs> the, 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 and Yoan and Mir are just like, and we could have gone there too. We had, <laughs> we had off days. It's funny you say that because they say like, Jakati talked about the race on their Instagram page and a certain someone said, hold the phone, I'll be there next year. And that person was MotoGP world champion Francesco Bagnaia. <laughs> Well, hopefully next year, uh, the electronics on his Panigale are uh, a little bit less, how we say, Italian. How very yes, 499p, a very 499p limiting factor. How very 499p starter motor of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, going to Paolo Shibati and Peko Banya, they're going to be taking it a lot more seriously next year. Um, and, uh, 
we'll, 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 we'll see how that goes down as well. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about Formula E in our next episode on uh, IndyCars, a Grand Prix of Toronto. Uh, another cold streak getting snapped in that one. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, next time out. But yes, we're going to talk about the Hungarian Grand Prix and McLaren having the most newsworthy, newsworthy and dramatic one-two finish since Sebastian Vettel and Mark Webber did it in Malaysia in 2013. The... The, 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 the fact I plucked that story out of there was completely coincidental, I, I, I promise. Um, multi-814, Lando. Yeah, well, multi-814. Of, mm, of course, of course. What else, what else could it be? Um, and, you know, the small, like, irrelevant story of Oscar Piastri is our newest Grand Prix winner. You know, we, we kind of forgot about that whole thing. You know, it's, it's kind of weird how these things turn out. Like, you know, Oscar Piastri is, is, is like the youngest Grand Prix winner in a you know, hot minute. Um, and he's the first race winner born in the 21st century. And yet, here we are. Um, uh, so, gets uh, it's also McLaren's first front row lockout ever. Uh, they became the youngest Grand Prix <laughs> one-two finishers uh, ever. Let's see. Uh, what else? Uh, Oscar Piastri also uh, single-handedly uh, ended communism in Hungary. Yeah, uh, yeah. What, what else have we got here? Uh, they... What, they, uh, they they put they put a Ligier on their new caps to sell. Um, that, that is a true story, actually. They have put a Ligier on their new cap to sell to the public with New Era. Um, so Mc, McLaren's going through it this week. They're having a week at the moment, to say the least. What are they? Are they? Uh, uh, we're talking about Max Verstappen as well because uh, apparently we've never messy. found an, we've, we've had, he had a messy race. He was he was being a bit of a messy bitch out there, and uh, hey. It turns out that uh, we found a new hook to blame for him not winning, and apparently it's him staying up late and not turning his PS5 off. Uh, more Damn, than- he just like me for real. For real, for real. <laughs> He's too busy playing pool blitz on his PS5. What a guy. Uh, more on that later. And a little bit more of the big news coming out of Audi. Because uh, Andrea Seidel gone, and JJ Abrams is back? <laughs> what oh. the what uh, the? Uh, <laughs> we're, we're, we're adding lens flare to our Formula One teams again. More on that at the end of the show. But places you can find us real quick. We are on youtube.com forward slash motorsport one one. If you want to watch our full episodes on there, you could do it on our audio boom page as well at motorsport one oh one, as well as iTunes, uh Spotify, all the good places where podcasts are now currently available. Um you can check out our website, motorsport one oh one dot com if you want some bonus content of me talking about them mclaren that and that grand prix in general as well as indycar in toronto and the bonus article that went up today talking about uh should red bull keep sergio perez we actually don't have enough time to really talk about it on this pod um we might do for spa next week we'll see how we go depending on how his weekend plays out but uh if you want some written thoughts from yours truly on whether red bull should play spa um, and then get rid of sergio perez um that's available on the website as well um you can follow us on social media motorsport 101 pod on instagram motorsport underscore 101 on elon musk's failed business investment and if you want to follow us on that one of on, many according one of to many, the uh apparently. according to the economy this week Mm-hmm. Yeah, who knew? Um, who, who could have possibly guessed? Um, and of course, if you want to follow us personally on that site, you can at Dre Harrison 101, at RJ O'Connell, and at C Buckley 917. And of course, if you really like us, you can back us financially on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash motorsport 101. Back us at any level. We can get some extra DRR content early. Five bucks gets you early access to everything that we do, um, audio, video, you name it. Um, and if you're back at the $10 level, you can join us in the supporters club of our Discord server, as well as listen to these episodes live as they are being recorded, as Kira and Jason are doing so in the chat right now. Thanks for listening in, guys. Much appreciated. Um, we'll hopefully get some of the chat involved as well. That's a, one of the perks of, of backing us at the Temple level. If you get into our Riverside, we could actually interact with us as we're recording this show. We can get some input in there as well. well that's fun, right? You Who can steer wanna... us off the guardrails. Just a little bit. you know. It's, yeah, it's, it's, that, it's, that's more or less how I got this gig. Yes, if we, if we lifted him off the couch. We couldn't get rid of him, and now he's stuck here, <laughs> as you do. But uh, right, uh, right after this, let's get into the 2024 Formula One Hungarian Grand Prix. Man, I what a race to wake up in like the last fifth of. Okay, so yeah, the timing sheet will say the McLaren had a one-two finish by 14 seconds. 
with Oscar Piastri taking his first Grand Prix win ahead of Lando Norris, ahead of Lewis Hamilton in third, getting his 200th career podium. 200. So that's what the timing sheet will say, and that's how the results stand. But in reality, never has such a dominant victory for an ascending team carried so much external drama because this race was marred with an ugly team orders row that became one of the biggest stories of the season so far. Oscar Piastri took the lead in the opening lap, held a two-second lead heading in the final round of pit stops, and Lando Norris behind him was pitted first and two laps earlier than Piastri did, giving him a two-lap undercut. And after the stops, Norris came out in front. He was told to swap positions with Piastri, who had led pretty much all the race up to that point, but Norris refused and refused. And his race engineer, Will Joseph, had to beg and plead with Norris to swap positions while extending his lead out to five seconds. Norris eventually relented with two laps to go, slowed down and let Piastri feel, leading Piastri, claiming his first Grand Prix win. But, oh boy. Where do we even start with this? This was a whole bag of uh, messy. So a couple questions to y'all. Mm. Who is responsible for this hot mess? Well, it's hard not to point the finger squarely at McLaren's pit wall. And I've rewatched this race just to see if I'd missed anything in the details um, that, you know, may have gone under the radar, did some maths, and I, it confirmed it. Well, it confirmed what I kind of already knew. Like, when Lando Norris came in on the undercut, Piastri had a 25 and a half second lead. You lose about 20 for a pit stop in Hungary and under full racing speed. So, like, like what they told Piastri on the radio when he came out in second was, we were trying to guard you from Lewis Hamilton. Now, Hamilton was the faster man at that point in the race towards the end of that second stint. That is absolutely true. He was taking a little bit of time here and there out of, out of that disadvantage that they had. It was about 29 seconds at the start of the stint. It went down to about 25. The point is, you had five and a half seconds in hand. Barring an, a disastrous pit stop, and, well, why would you bank on your team having a bad pit stop? You assume it, it runs smoothly. You could even have a, a thought to have a three or four second stop, and chances are you're going to be okay. Piastri comes out in front of Hamilton, and you've got the win secure. Instead, not only do you box Lando Norris, you give him not a one, but a two-lap undercut pretty much guaranteeing that he's going to come out in front. On, was, the undercut was powerful here. It was, it was worth about a second and a half a lap. Tires um, are always... And this becomes very important later. The tires are always worth a lot here. Mm -hmm. um, new rubber's worth a lot here. Yeah, new rubber's are... New rubber's worth so much lap time here if you can get, get it fired up. It just... It just feels like they overcomplicated what should have been a very easy decision. Do you think uh, it was because they were trying to get slick with it that they were trying that they were trying to like reverse the positions and, and think nobody would have noticed? Well, then they wouldn't or, or have called. It's just a matter of incompetence. Uh, well, then they wouldn't have made the call after the fact. That's that's, um, that's, that's what I was literally about to say. If it, if it was a genuine drive a swap, get Lando back out in front, and they wouldn't have immediately told him to give the position back. So it's either they've either they were either that was the plan and they immediately changed their minds when it actually played out that way, or it was just genuine malpractice and they were just trying to atone for what they felt yeah, was. And, generally, I'm using, and I'm using inverted commas here. Right in inverted when commas. I was, I was, when I just woke up and started assessing the situation, I'm thinking, hang on a second. When you're doing team orders like this, isn't it supposed to be to benefit the driver that's ahead in the championship? Because, as you know, Landon Norris is a distant second in the driver's championship behind Max Verstappen, but mm -hmm. he's still ahead of Oscar Piastri. And as I thought about it some more after the race, I'm just thinking, like, 
McLaren are conceding the driver's title and just going all in in the constructors. But that's what matter. I'm thinking they're doing here. But the constructors don't matter because your cars are going to be one and two either way. It doesn't matter which order they're in. You, you, you've got a one-two finish. And as we found out later on, Max struggled and you know Perez did as good as well as he could but this was going to be a big day for McLaren in the constructors it was the, it was the it was the first real counter punch that McLaren's landed in the constructors title fight but it doesn't matter what order the cars are in they're going to finish one two either way so the constructors isn't the issue like as you pointed out RJ if McLaren wants to challenge on all fronts the move is make sure Norris comes out in front because as we found out, Verstappen ultimately finished in fifth. This was a chance for Lando Norris to take 15 points out of Verstappen's championship lead. Was going to take it down from 84 before the weekend to potentially a very nice number um, instead. And they left seven points on the table that could have gone to Lando in that championship fight. Now, we can debate the ethics of whether it's too early to start playing those games in a championship fight because we're only 13 rounds into a 24-round season. We're, we're in the first race of the second half of the year. But it's hard to deny if you're McLaren and Oscar Piastri, who, bless him, is a very good driver, but is still 40 points behind Norris in the championship, the play is Lando. Like, I... Like that's I, just the most efficient way of doing it, right? It, it, it is, I, I, and like it is. We're, we're also in the point in the season where, like this time in the calendar year, fourteen years ago, Ferrari had no problems asking Felipe Massa to give up the win for Fernando Alonso to maximize his championship challenge. But at the I same time, when I think about this race in a vacuum, I just think Oscar was comprehensively the better driver, and it would have sucked for him to give up the win like this. Was he I, the better driver, though, given that he made a mistake in his second stint and coughed up the most of his three-second lead to bring Norris back into play? But why did Landon... He still pulled back away after that anyway. Yeah. I, and, did, I, 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 think, I, I think looking at it from the championship perspective is giving McLaren too much credit. I just think they panicked looking at Ham, the Hamilton gap and pitted the wrong driver. Because this is a team that is relearning how to win and win consistently with none of the people that were there in 2012. And you know what the most ironic thing about it was? They put their head of strategy on the podium when they celebrated the victory. I thought that was <laughs> hilarious. You, you, you're propping him up after that performance? Okay. Uh, uh, a race where you shit yourself and was five seconds out on the maps. Okay. I mean, look, a strategy, a strategy to make the Benotto era Ferrari blush. More on that later. And, and look, you can't realistically be asking Lando Norris to give up a victory because that's essentially what you told Lando to do. It's the ultimate team orders call. It's Valtteri Bottas at Sochi all over again. Remember mm -hmm. that one for Mercedes when they told Valtteri to give up a win? So not, not even to help Hamilton all that much. It was specifically so that Hamilton could go two races in front in terms of points in the, in the Drivers' Championship. It was yeah. arguably an, an unnecessary move, but it was ruthless, but it was effective. And Valtteri, God bless his soul, he's a, he's a better man than me as a team player, actually gave up a win to Lewis Hamilton yeah. I mean, in, or, in order to help that championship. Rubens Barrichello did it in Austria not once, because we all remember the one in 2002, but twice because it's it was twice. the second year in a row and he did it. And mm -hmm. we hate Ferrari for doing it at the time, but it ended up working out. We hate it so much we banned team orders in F1 for a little while. We we banned team orders in the sense that well, okay, okay, you can you can do it. You just have to put in very coded messages to treat us like children when we listen to the team radio and not and actually not think that we know what you're up to. <laughs> you can't ask Lando to give up the win. That was horseshit. Like, and I understand like Lando is like, and honestly there's two ways to do this either you just ride it out and let Lando take the win 
and say, sorry, Oscar, we, 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 we screwed up the strategy. Bad luck. We're really sorry. We'll try and have a make good on this. Instead, you've got Will Joseph writing a goddamn sonnet, like a love letter. I'm surprised he didn't play Cupid's Chokehold by Gym Class Heroes, begging the man to try and give up the win. It's like, take a look at that, that race win. <laughs> That, the that's the only one I got. <laughs> the, oh, my God. Uh, that I thought was incredibly stupid. I feel like Stella should have just got a radio and said, Lando, this is a direct order. Give up the place. Instead, they just were dancing around it for a good 15 laps. And then at the same time, Lando around it. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, Lando was trying to prove a point. He went out there and started rooting his tires to set fastest laps. And it worked. He was five seconds in front when he eventually parks it on the start finish line to let Piastri through. It was like, and, and Cam will relate this. I mentioned this on the call. We talked about it. It was Laurie Spaz all over again when they were in, in World Superbikes when he was told to, like, to, to to make sure Tom Sykes finished in front of you for the sake of the championship. Stopped it on the fucking line. Yeah, he stopped the bike directly in front of the start finish line at Magni Corps, his home Grand Prix, just to make the point that yes, I'm going to help Tom Sykes out, but I'm going to make it as awkward and as difficult looking as possible. Like just, just, just like so last year, 2002. Yeah. My man, made it the same awkward. time. This, this will have been the second race in a row that Oscar got completely hosed by the McLaren pit wall. Cause they fucked him completely over in Silverstone, a race that he very well could have won as well. Yeah. Had they not left him out an extra lap. So again, I don't even look at this as a championship play. I just look at this as McLaren not really knowing what to do with a one-two. And here's the other thing with Lando Norris, who again, I like Lando Norris, but I'm also noticing, as of many other people, that like he he can't hold a lead from pole position as it stands. No. Yeah, this is like the fifth time. I think this is the fifth time. This is he has the fifth lead. time. We've had so so many infographics about say. Landon Norris is at five pole positions. He's not been able to convert one of them. Doesn't have the win, at least, in Miami, but that was not from pole position. <sighs> what's he doing well, being beat at the first corner? What's he doing try, trying so hard to cover off his teammate that Verstappen got a run around him on the outside? Not that it worked. Yeah. Yeah, he, they certainly left the door open. I mean, it's hungry. It's virtually impossible to pass around there. It's impossible to pass around the outside of turn one. I don't know what Max was doing, putting his car out there. He was never going to win that battle. But point is, is that you're absolutely right. Lando Norris has coughed up the lead on five separate occasions on, on off the grid. He's a poor starter. And... and he, he keeps letting Oscar Piastri and Max Verstappen beat him off the line. And on a race like this, where track position in Hungary was always so important, if Max gets to turn one in the lead, he probably wins. His pace wasn't the best, but how are you passing him? Like, yeah. unless you're beating yeah. him out of the pits, um, you're, you're not beating him on track because... Because passing... And I, I still will get to Max in a minute, but teams still don't seem to understand it's nearly impossible to pass at Hungary. And people yeah. were always who, underestimate who, that. Who had the benefit who had the benefit of recent years of just like the DRS is so strong and now it's not. And then you remember, this is Hungary. This was Bar this was what we think Barcelona was, still is. <laughs> Passing yeah. always comes at a premium here. How do you not know this? What five or six teams did, and it's actually shocked me how many teams got this wrong. Um, Red Bull, probably most of all, which would be a nice segue, is they kept betting on tire advantage over track position. And on this day, in this heat, with these tires, track position ruled all. Because you spent any length of time behind someone, your front tires would just, just go out the window. Which brings us to Max Verstappen's race. He spent most of the race getting undercut by those around him. He fell behind the McLarens on the medium tire. On the final stops, he was undercut by Lewis Hamilton and Charles Leclerc. He still had a chance at the podium, but then going into turn one, Verstappen collides with Hamilton after he locks up. Max finishes fifth. Lewis gets the podium place, and Verstappen's not happy on the radio. He has an explosive set of tie rates of pretty much everybody at the pit wall. And I think we know why this is. He's spending too much time staying up late playing his damn video games. 
<laughs> Which, again, honestly, I, relatable. <laughs> can, I, can I take two minutes on this one? Because I, I've got... I, I had to unload on on Twitter this morning in regards to this, because in Go on, the King. passing days since, Helmut Marco has now come out and said that Max Verstappen will no longer represent Team Redline um, during a race weekend if a stint is involved at night. Um, because, yeah, it turns out that Max himself was the you know, did a stint that finished at three in the morning um, drum on, on Saturday night going into Sunday morning into the race. Now, ignoring the context of the fact that, as Marco admitted after the race, Verstappen still had seven hours of sleep, which is a lot more than I get, let me tell you. Um, mm-hmm. Like, one... People that wanted to say, oh, well, he had this race result because he was tired. One, you cannot prove that. I always say to to arguments like this, would this hold up in a court? The answer nine times out of ten is no. It's it's very convenient to say, oh, he's tired. It's very tired, and that's the reason why he hit Hamilton. Look, Hamilton didn't make a big deal about it. Verstappen didn't make a big deal about of course, that. Of course, Hamilton didn't make a big deal out of because he ended up better in the exchange. Of course. And Max was like, it's a racing incident. The stewards thought it was a racing incident, and that was the end of the matter. But of course, you can't tell Hamilton and Verstappen's fans that because they think they know better than the drivers do. And uh, dear, stop us if you've heard that one before with those two audiences in the last few years. And then second of all, why was this not meant? Like Harry Benjamin was the only person who mentioned this during Imola's broadcast when he filled in for Sky Sports. Um, David Croft um, during the Emilia Romagna Grand Prix earlier this year, a race where again Max Verstappen was representing Team Redline in a twenty-four hour race, which he won, and then won the Imola Grand Prix on Sunday, a very narrow, very close race by less than a second, by the way, but. That wasn't a problem then. If anything, it was turned into a huge story about how Max did double duty and won both races and looked like a goddamn champ. Christian Horner called him a, quote, driving machine as a way of describing his brilliance over that weekend, being able to win in sim racing and in the real world. Why is it only a convenience now that he's lost? No, exactly. It's, It's, and look, this is mostly the fault of David Croft and Nico Rosberg on Sky's broadcast, who used that as their hook and stick to beat Max with, and completely ignored the fact that McLaren has been the best team in Formula One for the last seven races now. The scoreboard literally says so, that they've been the best team in F1 for the last seven rounds, since, ironically, Imola, right? And right. yet, with only we're now two Grand Prix Max wins to show for it, yeah, right. Uh, in that same period, right? Verstappen so, is still Verstappen is still gained twenty points on Norris, his next closest competitor in that time period. Despite right. the fact not, that the car is stiff, is so stiff at the front, despite that they've lost the way of their upgrade pass, and despite the fact that Verstappen's looked a little ropey, yeah, right, ropeier mean, than he has been in recent years. Yeah, they bought they brought a big high downforce upgrade package. Ironically, it looks a lot more like how last year and the year before Red Bull looked at the back of the car Mm. um and the thing is isn't that it didn't work because that car was a a a rocket ship in high speed and medium speed corners but a low speed and then it didn't fix what's wrong with it the red bull has really high roll stiffness on the front of the car that very stiff very compliant in a specific way suspension Ironically, the the major thing that Newey is responsible for, his signature on this generation of Red Bulls, well, it's now their limit. It's their limitation. Because in low speed, the front of the car is just not in the track. And we saw it a couple times during the race. Max turned in for the corner and the front of the car just said, no, thank you. Um, the first time he tried to pass Hamilton, he turned in uh, into turn two and the car just wasn't having it. No, nope. the second time he tried to pass Hamilton, a uh, bit messy that one. Yeah, <laughs> how very Haref ninety seven on this whole thing. So that suspension so stiff it survived that fall because that car was doing its best reverse Marcus Ericsson. Shout out yeah. to the Rocket League edit. <laughs> I did see that. 
That was fantastic. Very good. That, was, that was very good. Um, no, uh, but, but yeah, it's it, it feels like a piling up of that, coupled to just for once a really not very good strategy from the uh, from those on the pit wall at Red Bull. The first time they got undercut could probably be excused because they just got undercut by the car behind them. The second time, what were they doing? Because I could have told you, I could have bet the world that Lewis and Charles were going to undercut Max. And it's like they landed on this weird middle ground strategy. I thought they were going for the one stop in the first stint. Me too. And it did work. Yuki Sonoda made it worthy, and he ended up ninth for it. Yuki Sonoda had a one stop strategy and averted in the points, which is mm-hmm. great for a driver who had who just completely chunked his car in qualifying. Yeah, he turned that thing into a no no low ballers. I know what I have. <laughs> Thank you. Too. Yeah. Q three. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So no, I I, I agreed with Cam. I, as I was watching that race in real time, I thought Red Bull was going to pull the one stopper because I thought it's the only way they've got a shot of winning this race. Um, for, it turns out that forty one laps on the hard tire was roughly a little bit too much. It wasn't completely beyond the realms of possibility, as Yuki Tsunoda went on to prove that yeah, again he ended up finishing ninth. But this Red Bull has issues. This Red Bull has now got weaknesses that are now exploitable by McLaren, who have a much better setup in low-speed corner than where mechanical grip is more predominant in this car at the moment. I think Red Bull will likely go back on top at Spa again this weekend, but in the, in a low-speed track like Hungary with a lot of low-speed corners, the McLaren was always going to do well here. <sighs> yeah, it, it was amazing watching it because in the first sector, Verstappen was always fastest in qualifying, and then all the time would just piss away through the sixth and seventh, that, that little chicane in the middle, the middle mm-hmm. sector. Um, and while you would expect them to come back at Spa, given Red Bull has absolutely annihilated the field more than they usually do two years in a row, The big task at Red Bull has to be fixing this roll stiffness issue because roll stiffness is twin to your aerodynamic platform. People say, oh, why don't they just soften up the front of the car? That hurts your aero. That hurts your downforce. It's something they can fix, but it is not an immediate nor easy fix. I believe that they can do it, but the defining thing for Red Bull for the rest of this year has to be being able to soften up the front of this car and make it a more compliant car in roll over bumps, over curbs, um, without losing their prodigious downforce production, because that is the rock upon which Red Bull has built their championship church the last couple of years. They need to fix it because they sure as shit ain't winning the constructors championship at this rate. No, which <laughs> should we talk about? The Paris thing, because like, yeah, I, don't know. I mean, I mean, I mean yeah, it, it's kind of ironic. I'm, I'm, that- I'm sad. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to see one of my favorite drivers go out sad like this, but I'm, I'm preparing for it. I'll give him it's, this. It, His race wasn't actually half bad. I mean, the there's the problem, Dre, is that him totaling the car in Q1 and having to come back through the field for seventh is the best weekend he's had in months. Yeah. That was a genuinely good race from Checo. Seventh was the realistic maximum he was going to get given the top six are in another legal altogether. The pants and, off of Russell on a um, equivalent yeah. situation. And yeah, absolutely destroyed George Russell, who is in a car that isn't far behind in terms of relative performance right now, and stuffed Russell into a locker. That is the sort of shit that if Perez starts that race from an even respectable qualifying spot, he's probably in the top five. And you say, you know what? Fair enough. That's fine. If Max is third and Checo is fifth, no one's complaining about Checo. That's fine. Well, he wasn't even a million miles off of Max on the hard tire. He was very good. Him being able to start on the hard tire set him up for a really productive race. The problem is that he crashed the car in Q1 on just... Yeah. One of those crashes where you go... I've seen those in public lobbies. Yeah, it happens. It's a, the thing is, though, it wasn't a huge mistake because it rained minutes before that qualifying session started. Yeah. It was a very slippery track at that point in time. It wasn't a huge mistake. It's just the accumulation of the mistakes that Perez has made has made people run out of patience. It was the Great. fourth it's time just, in the... Yeah, it's just, Get it's out of my head. Get out yeah. of my head. My same statement was in my, my fucking mouth. 
its fourth Q1 elimination in the last six races. That That's, even with the current, even with the RB20 being a bit of a tricky car, that is insanely bad. It's unsustainable. It's it's untenable form. It's why people are having the conversation about moving on from him. And this honestly, is the first weekend where you could say like. Marco has been very vocal about it. This, I feel, is the first weekend where Horner has been like, look, we can't keep doing this. We can't keep walking one legged because McLaren are here. McLaren on a certain type of track are ahead of you. They are going to run you down in the constructors. Yeah, I I feel like the constructors is already lost. They're 51 points behind. We have 11 races to go. And McLaren have the best all-round team in Formula 1 right now. They have a very quick car on low speed, low downforce setups. They are going to win races now. There is no question about it in my mind. They've probably got at least three or four more in them between now and the end of the year, maybe more. And Oscar Piastri is 1% off. Lando Norris now. Well, Piastri is, he's not quite Lando, but he's close and he's close enough. He's where he, getting he, closer. The yeah. last two or three races, he has been, I feel, much closer to Lando, not just in terms of the raw speed, because I actually think Lando has gapped him a little this year in yeah. terms of raw speed. Mm-hmm. But I think Oscar has traded that back and has been yes. much better over a stint and on his tires this year. And it's that gap closing that is what you expect of a team that has two of the best young prospects to come from Jupiter Formula Racing up to Formula One, who are now starting to reach the peak of their abilities. And look, and here's the thing, right? I'll let you in on a little spoiler before you read my Red Bull column. I do ultimately say that I think Red Bull should keep Checo for at least the rest of the year, because chucking out four years of data and starting fresh with a new dude, whether, whether it's Daniel Ricciardo, Yuki Tsunoda, or even Liam Lawson, because hey, hell, I'll let you in the little secret. John Noble made that suggestion to me when I met him up for drinks at all sports summer party the other day. It was like, yeah, they, they, should give, they should give Lawson a go. And I'm like, wow, that's bold. Um, but, you know, it's one of them things. I think it's a lot harder to start over with somebody mid-season. It so is. I, it absolutely it, is. Like, how many but, mid-season moves have we seen in the era of limited testing that actually work out? Rarely, Liam Lawson's the one exception, and um, in in recent times, and that was he wasn't even supposed, and he wasn't even supposed to get there. No, and the point I'm getting at here is, is that at the moment, the top eight in Formula One, besides Checo, the other seven seats in F1, it's never been more stacked. Whoever you're asking to replace Checo with is going to have to compete with. Piastri, Norris, Leclerc, Sainz, Russell, and Hamilton. What do those six men have in common? They've all won a Grand Prix this season. You know what? This is the most Grand Prix winners we've had since 2012, and yet nobody in this pack sticks out like a Pastor Maldonado of a bunch. Well, yeah, we've had uh, had seven. Because the problem. The problem for the driver's championship at this point is that Max could still legitimately take the next three weekends off and still be leading. Mm-hmm. Everyone else who has won a race has won one race this year. He's won seven. Yeah. And that Everybody. makes and this is the first time that like the talk of the, the driver's championship being under threat. I just don't see Max losing that many points because Lando only just took some points out of him. And it wasn't as many as he could or should have done. Hmm. Right. It could have been um, 15. It was only eight in the end. Yeah. And for, I mean, for the same, like, there's been plenty of talk of, oh, will this trigger Max to move to Mercedes? Somehow, I don't think a performance clause in his contract going, well, I'm only ahead of everyone else by three races is going to be able to be triggered. Yeah, people want that narrative to bond because Mercedes have gone from off the pace to, hey, we're in range if some shit happens. Which is where Mercedes are at right now because Hamilton was still 15 seconds behind the winning car, and I, was I only do think it would. Yeah, I do think it would be funny though if Verstappen like burns this relationship to the ground just so he could go to a team that'll let him do sim racing, whatever he wants. Yeah, to to get him, Toto Wolff will let him play any console to whatever hour. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, it took, I mean, did, did that have you convinced Lewis Hamilton to come over in 2013? Well, was that Ross Braun going, hey, we'll let you bring Roscoe to a race event. How about that? <laughs> Sold. 
It's, um, so let me sign that dotted line real quick. Um, Jokes aside, the championships are just an extra. They're just a perk. Of Jokes course. aside, of course. Mm. Um, but yeah, so I I don't know what Red Bull does right now. <sighs> On form, you'd want to bring up Yuki Tsunoda. The problem isn't so much. A, a lot of the discussion has been about Yuki's temperament, and they have a point. He's still a bit of a hothead, but he is also the hot hand. I think the bigger problem for Yuki is that all you're getting is a rental. He's a Honda oh, guy. If he imp- if he impresses over at Red Bull, he's probably going to get plugged in at Aston Martin for 26. And then you're in the same seat all over again. But for who? Yeah. Because Fernando Alonso has got two more years. He's guaranteed a 26 spot if he wants it. Oh, I don't know. It, it, but judging by the way he's been talking on the radio, I don't even know if he's going to come up to the races <laughs> next weekend. He's too busy uh, being confused for an eight for an Axis GP car. <sighs> yeah, good luck. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, the new Valkyrie LMH does look pretty nice. Um, I'm not, get, I'm not get saying ready to learn hypercar, buddy. Get ready to relearn hypercar. Here, here um, in the chat says, do you really think Alonso wants to stay there? And I say, well, yeah, because he's got no alternative and he clearly wants to stay in F1. Because if he did, he wouldn't be signing a two year extension. There's to- always time for another Endstone reunion. <laughs> Get he w- the hell out of this chat. Get out of my podcast. The thing is, right, every time Alonso... Every t- my man I'm very commandeering it, I'm checking him out. Not, through, not, not over my dead body, Buckley. Now, the point I'm getting Your at terms here is, are acceptable. My, the point I'm getting at here is that every time Alonso sat down on the negotiating table, he wants multiple years. That's the issue. Like when he was at Alpine and Aston Martin, he's wanted multiple years and Aston Martin's prepared to give it to him. The amazing thing is if he makes 2026 and the new regulation changed, he'll be the first 45-year-old driver on the grid since Graham Hill in 1973. (laughs) Well, that'd be four full engine regulation changes. The 10s, the 8s, then the hybrid 6s, and now the twin turbo biofuel 6s. I guess that will be a stout. Out, yeah, well, yeah, that's astounding longevity. And again, this is with what three gap years: two thousand two, twenty nineteen, twenty twenty. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I mean, this is a guy. He debuted in a one, didn't he? I mean, that is yeah, on the minority for minority. So I mean, that would be God. His twenty is is his twenty third season in F one. If that holds up, that is incredible. It's, 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 I mean, he's going to be the only member of the 400 race club if that contract goes all the way to the end. 400. It's, it's the Valentino Rossi of appearance checks because he's the only man in MotoGP in the 400 club when it comes to overall appearances. Yeah, there's a few guys close. in the... Yeah, there's no one close. There's a, there's a few dudes in the threes, but there's no one in the fours. Um, like not, not even close. Um, and to move, before we move on, Vic asking in the chat as well. The other question is, how long will Aston put up with Alonso's shit if he keeps being short-tempered? they will put up with it because Aston Martin, since they got here, have wanted a big-name fancy fuck-off showpiece yeah. driver. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they, they, <laughs> remember, they paid Sergio Perez 10 million quid to not come to work so they could go sign Sebastian Vettel. Think about that. They left they, after two years. They told one of the best midfielders in recent Formula One history, Kick Rocks, we're bringing in Seb, who came off a horrible final two years at Ferrari. And Seb justified his expenditure in the end. He was pretty good in the two years he was with Aston Martin. But even so, like, it wasn't great. And how, um, by the way, how, how much would Aston badly wish for, for Sebastian Vettel's development in the car now, given where they're at right now? Oh, boy. Uh. Oh, no, that, that launch spec 2022 Aston Martin was haunting. Cheeks. Cheeks. Anyway. Fernando Alonso, another masterclass of developing the car backwards so he can maintain his position as the best power I'm going to make this car worse to enhance my grind. <laughs> That's right. I told the landlord to increase my rent. That's how much I believe in the grind. Uh, speaking of increasing your rent to uh, to believe in the grind, let's talk about Audi, who uh, oh, just God. blew up their management structure 18 months away from their highly contentious and anticipated Formula One debut. 
Oliver Hoffman and Andre Seidel are leaving the project after just 19 months in charge and again 18 months away from its debut, bringing in a new chief of operations, a former team principal of a race winning team. It's Mattia Bonato, formerly of Ferrari. Um, I can tell you what I make of this startling news. Um, regardless of who they brought in, this is not good to have this much upheaval halfway between announcing it and it getting to the showroom floor. The Audi announcement was the Audi purchase of Sal was three years ago to this month. Yep. Um, and I generally thought bringing in Andrea Seidel, the CEO, uh, and put him in on the board, I thought was a great move. He was universally respected in motorsport. He did a very good job with a not great McLaren team at the time. Got mm -hmm. him into the top three as a constructor again during the pandemic. Andrea Seidel is one of the best in the business. Um, and... I distinctly remember being told when I was working for WTF1 internally that Andrea Seidel walked into what was then Alfa Romeo, looked around, and immediately got on the phone to Audi and said, you need to put some more money into this now because I know what a championship team looks like and it doesn't look like this. And if you're Audi, you're not in this for anything less than that. Like, you are one of the biggest names in motorsport, one of the biggest names in the automotive industry, period. You're not here to be a midfield team. Not when you're building your own power units and you're a full-blown factory. Hell no. So what I understand, like, apparently there was conflict before this between Hoffman, who was chief representative officer, and Seidel, who was... South Group CDO. Um, and now to resolve the conflict, they've both left. <laughs> It's 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 Holtzman. It, it, it's 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 AG systems in Wipeout all over again when when they split up and create Kyrex and Oricom. It, it, it's 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 there's, there's a deep cut for you uh, Wipeout fans out there. <laughs> but um, I I for the life of me do not understand what the fuck is going on in that camp where Seidel feels like he has to walk away a year and a half out from your debut. Like, is, like if the rumors sign. are true that he wanted Hoffman out, like, he, he would have won the war anyway. You'd think. But again, I don't know what was causing the internal conflict, so I can't, I can't speculate on that too tough. But on any level, this is a disaster. Like, this is not how factory F1 teams should be run by any stretch of the imagination. Cam is, is stare. He's taking his glasses off and he's stared into space for the last three minutes. Buckley, talk to me. You look lost back there. <laughs> in fact, he's, he's, he's left this chair and he's walked away. They, they, so, he, and, put, and put this into the context of just like, Audi, and I, and I hate to sound like crabby entitled sports card fan who remembers the good old days, but Audi walked away from rebadging 963s and putting them on the hypercar grids and a very good customer racing program, multiple levels, because there's so much marketing value potential in Formula One. And there is. There certainly is. But there will always be the expectation of like, hey, you're giving up this, this, and this, and these are all good for you. Y you better make this work. <laughs> Because and Toyota gave up a lot when they came mm -hmm. to Formula One the last time around. They gave up endurance sports car racing. They gave up rallying to go into Formula One. They spent billions of dollars, and it got them no wins. Now, I for one think that if Toyota were to ever do this again, and no, I'm not counting that rumored Haas sponsorship deal as getting back into Formula One at full force, they would be better than they were last time around. Uh, but we're not at that point. Audi, there will always be expectations because of what they gave up to get here. And now it is just looking like a mess. And again, it's not even so much about like what you think Mattia Bonato was or was not at Ferrari, or whether if you believe the rumors that Mike Crack is going to jump in from Aston Martin to, uh, to take what is effectively Andreas Seidel's old job. 
the instability by itself is just, it doesn't look good. You, you have to treat this as just like, Sabre as we know it is going to end in 2025 and a new team is going to take its place in 2026. But it doesn't look good. How many, uh, sorry, I had, to, I had to go say a prayer. Um, how many points does Sauber have right now? Zero. How many? Zero. They're the only Zero. team in F1 that hasn't scored a point yet. Zero. You know, I haven't built a Formula One car. Um, I haven't actually entered my car in the uh, 2024 Formula One championship. Um, and yet I have as many points as a team principal as Sauber do right now. Kira stole my brain cell and said that Valtteri Bottas is currently 21st in a 20-car championship based on countback. <laughs> and you know the irony? Despite, despite the fact that he is single-handedly ending Zhou Guan Yu's career. Yeah, Zhou yeah. Guan Yu, in a year where he needs to perform, is driving the worst that he's been in the three years since he's been here. And for Valtteri Bottas, it just doesn't matter because he's not getting any points, or even like 11ths or 12ths out of this. It's just, it, it, it's the same as last year. They're just fucking 14th every weekend. Yeah. Uh, you know what's it, funny as well? I think, I'm pretty sure when I was do, working out my stats on this, Valtteri Bottas's average finish this year is exactly 14. Why are they always 14th? It, 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 they're just Andreas solidly Seidel lower end right. mid. Yeah. The last, uh, since he walked into that team, that he got on the phone to Audi, to Volkswagen, and said, we need more money. Remember the championship squad that I ran under your company? This being Volkswagen, of course, with Porsche. This is not that. We need money. We need investment. Because Audi could build the best damn Formula One engine on, in the history of motorsport. If it's going to that back of that Sauber of equivalent quality of this, it won't matter. You and need the rumors yeah. ain't that without yeah. its engine. You um, need you need a, a team of roughly a thousand people to one thousand to twelve hundred to be yeah. a championship level roster at this point. I and need to know what happened. Uh, uh, we're not going to probably find out ever what happened unless it leaks out. But something had to have happened for this to be eighteen months out from you hitting the track and the two most important people in your program are shit can and gone. One of them, a verified, very high quality team principal. And you hired Mattia Benotto who dragged Ferrari to their lowest point in 40 years. He was also the head of the engine department during Dynasty Run Schumacher years. Okay, so lock him in the engine room at Audi and don't let him touch anything else. You're not asking him to be team principal. He's You're asking. Asking. Oh, though. You are, because, though. Because <laughs> Salva's structure is different. We all knew Andreas Seidel was, was, the, was the guy pulling the chains, despite the fact he, like, he, create, he was given a role in the team where he didn't have to roll up at the race weekends every week. That was Alessandro Aluni Bravi's job. When uh, over there now was, quote, team representative. <laughs> like, I, I, how does Matteo Bonotto, who dragged Ferrari down to sixth, in the Constructors' Championship not that long ago, has fallen up into... I wouldn't call this fallen up. <laughs> you, you get to run Audi's Formula One team on, on status... He was running alone. Ferrari's Formula One team directly into the ground, mind you. It's not that far behind is my point. If you're, you're running the VW Group's F1 team, that's one of the few groups in 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 auto in the automotive industry that can hold a candle to Ferrari. But you know it's likely it won't be running it alone. Because if they get my crack, it's it's gonna From be From the way that this has been run thus far, I don't know if we can say that with confidence. Because from <laughs> everything on the outside out, outside the engine program, it feels like it feels like Audi isn't really putting anything into this team. Which is weird because, like, it's not like the customer racing program is draining you of your bank balance because you own the I team now, all of it. You, you're one hundred percent owner. You have complete control of this team. Why are you not trying to hit the ground running for twenty twenty six? 
what remaining customers you have in sports car and touring car racing are having to be careful not to junk their cars because there are no more spares because you cut the support. They weren't even developing their LMDH, RJ. It was going to be a badge and some body work on the Porsche 963. And they gave that up. And they killed what that. Is- and then they didn't really give it up because Lamborghini's money all goes to Audi and Lamborghini has their own completely clean sheet car that has nothing to do with the 963. Corporate corporate conglomerates, am I right? Um, yes. this, this, none of it feels good. And it feels a lot less good seeing this 18 months out from when an Audi Formula One car should be hitting the track in anger for the first time. This better be a case where... where- Somebody digs this up in two years' time, and we just look stupid because Audi busts out of the box like crazy. Because like it's not looking good right now. Don't worry, O'Connell. And- I've got Plan B for you. It's this emergency button in my hand that says it could be worse. It could be Alpine. Oh yes, uh, the factory who will no longer even be a factory because, by all accounts, they're de- they're they're basically gutting for it. You know. Good God. And again, like runs runs true to like this through line of like Flavio Briatore is somehow the only person out of the six billion people living on this earth that can make Team Endstone a completely competent team. Uh, I don't know. But- there was there was two years where again, despite his best efforts, Eric Bourrier was getting them wins. And trust me, it wasn't him. Oh Lord. Uh, it's I mean I've never lived in an era where Renault didn't have a presence as a Formula One engine slash power unit builder. And yes, I'm counting the years from 98 to 2000 where call Mechachrome slash Supertech what it is. Those are rebadged 97 Renaults with a little extra oomph in them to try and keep pace with Ferrari and Mercedes. Anyway, I'm going to sidetrack. I never knew an era without them around as an engine builder or power unit constructor, but they've been stuck in this perpetual vicious cycle of power units bad, can't get any customers, which means no extra data, which means power units stay bad and nobody wants them. Cycle continues. I brought this up before, but in this era that they banged their fist on the table and demanded or they were going to leave Formula One, they demanded these power units. They came into this power unit era as the force to which there was no immovable object in the back of the Red Bulls, in the back of the Lotuses in 2013. And yet, not at any point in the V6 turbo hybrid era have they had the best engine. For the most part, they never even had the second best engine, maybe at altitude at times in 2020. With a little help from a little extra Elmore juice in the the back of it, and what is is a totally tag Hoyer, Formula One power unit. Yes, uh, the watch, the noted watchmaker that, you know, was a sticker. And remember, at the end of the V8 era, like, they had these great engines. Actually, you also remember in 2020, in 2020, it wasn't even that because Red Bull was was rocking the Honda power units. Yeah, that that was when Daniel Ricciardo had his uh, last real moment in the sun. Here's the thing, like, even even back in, like, the, the later years of the V8 era, like, yes, Red Bull and Renault won so many championships. You remember, like, immediately before that, when the Renault V8s were so, like, woefully underpowered that, like, they got an engine development freeze just to, like, help them not be so bad? Yeah, and then they rolled into 2009, and they were terrific. Not that you'd know it in the back of the R29, because sweet Jesus. Ah, uh, the R25 uh, is better. Infinitely better. How is that even a contest? But... What a damning fucking indictment on Renault's entire involvement in Formula One in the modern era, that the solution to fix your team is to get out of your team. And beg Mercedes for a new engine, suspension and gearbox. And they don't even want to build their own gearbox. It's it goes back to Renault trying to they're trying to build a championship team on a budget relative to those around them. And that ain't how formula one works. That ain't how that's not how formula one has ever worked. It, if you're that insistent on dropping your engine program, why did you sell a quarter of your team off last year? So you don't have to pay for it anymore. So uh, that's, an e- that's the easiest, that's the easiest question you could ask of Reno. Why did you sell this chunk of your team? Oh, we didn't want to pay for it anymore. Why are you killing off your engine program? Well, it's bad and we don't want to pay for it anymore. If you don't want to pay for it anymore, just leave the fucking sport. 
It, like, it's embarrassing. They 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 sold a quarter of their team off for two hundred million euros last year, and they promised they would reinvest that money into expanding the team, and they're actually contracting. My 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 heart and sympathies go out to the people in Viri who might have their jobs affected by this because it can't read for pleasant reading when your names and when your name is being dragged out in public. And your new department is the subject of getting roasted and torn apart on social media because the bosses and the higher ups do not fundamentally know how to understand and run an F one team yep. properly. When there's when there's letters when there's letters coming out out of the woodwork that previous management were firing people for being too close to the previous management on a whim, and you wonder why this team is so dysfunctional. And in all of this, putting it together in my head. We're only going to go into this next engine formula, having done, having re-architected all of these engines to get the cost down. We're only going to have one more engine manufacturer than we previously did. Yeah. Because we're going to be fun. gaining Red Bull for, with Ford stickers. Yeah. And we're going to be gaining Audi, but we're going to be losing Renault. Yeah. But we're, only, we're only at five when we should be at six. We might go up to seven in 2028 when when Cadillac GM uh, finally enters with theirs. With, 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 well, they'll be there as a supplier. Whether they'll be there with a factory team remains to be seen. Um, well, we'll have to wait G- and see. GM has made it exceedingly clear that for them it's Andretti or bust. And nobody wants to sell the existing entry to Andretti, not even Alpine, who is competent, is determined to run this team on the cheap because Why you want to give up your spot. Why nobody would you? Want, nobody wants to prove an expansion. Line go up. No, Why would you sell? Nobody. Nobody. Man, this is a mess. Hey, so, but hey, we got Deadpool helmets first for Belgium. I mean, that's yeah, cool. Yeah, they're spending they're spending more money on their paint department, and there ain't that much on the Alpine these days than they are on their power unit department. That's fucking embarrassing as a work. But hey, at least we can watch Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman eat hot wings by the time this episode goes out. That'll be nice, right? I am. That'll I'm, be the most entertaining thing about Alpine's Formula One program in years. I cannot believe I'm at a point where I'm saying I'm so glad Esteban Ocon gets to be free of these shadows to go to a competently run team like Haas. Imagine saying that a year ago. <laughs> we should end on that. Show's yeah, over. Places done. you can find us. We're done. We're yeah, done. Yeah, we're done here. We, we, did, we did the places you can find us in the housekeeping earlier. F1 is back this weekend for the Belgium Grand Prix at Spa. The final race before um, the uh, summer break and uh, Formula One takes three weeks off. Um, and my God, do we fucking need it. What a, what a hot mess of a race that was. Hopefully Spa will be a bit more straightforward. But then again, Max Verstappen's taking a 10 place grid penalty for that race. So who knows what could happen in the midfield? God knows. Well, God knows at this point. Um, God knows how many laps it'll take for him to get up from uh, from 12th on the grid. Yeah. Uh, next up, uh, we've got uh, we got we've got uh, Toronto's IndyCar race. A little bit about Formula E as well. And don't worry, only one more weekend till the bikes are back at the British Grand Prix. Yes, I've missed Moto GP you know nice, so much. Yeah, you know nice it is to be excited about bikes. And, and no more Freddie Spencer. <laughs> Yo. Yes! Spencer's gone at the end of the year. This is a win for beehives everywhere. Um, and Simon Crayfast taking that job instead. So, uh, new whipping him. boy! New whipping boy! Wait, fresh please. meat. Please, <laughs> God. Please, God, be better. Can't be any worse than Freddie Spencer was. Anyway, I've been Dre Harrison. Don't They've been our challenge. <laughs> <laughs> They've been RJ O'Connor and Cam Buckley. Um, we'll be back next time for IndyCar's Grand Prix of Toronto. Until then, thank you very much for listening, and we'll catch you guys next time. Sayonara. Y'all, can somebody run Team Endstone that wasn't previously like exile from the sport for race fencing? Is it possible for somebody to be out there that's like good at this? <laughs>